Right, well, it's a very great pleasure to welcome everyone to our science policy lecture, which, as I've said, is an association with the Systematics Association. And again, uh, Mark Wilkinson, the, the president of the Systematics Association, is here, and he will be handling the, the Q&A um, session at, at, at the end of the talk. Um, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome our speaker tonight, uh, Mustafa Zaidi. It's very unusual for um, uh, us to have at the Biological Society for the financial services industry to be represented at, at a society <laughs> such as the Linnean Society. Um, but defending the integrity of biodiversity and the environment across his many disciplines, as I'm sure we'll all agree. And after all, what better forum, um, a forum for natural history, the Linnean Society is for this kind of talk. Mustafa Zaidi is a director of research from Claremont, a wealth management and financial advisory service. He has had over 22 years of investment experience. He studied um, economics at Brown University and war studies at King's College in, in London and was at Balliol College, Oxford. He's an advisor significantly to Synchronicity Earth, which is a non-profit global conservation organization. He's taken part in debates, although I've said that we don't usually have financial services people in biological societies, he's actually taken um, part in debates in, at UCL, at the Zoological Society of London. He's given um, a student lecture here at the Linnean Society a while ago. Um, so we are very pleased to have him. Welcome, Mr. Ver. His lecture is entitled, Lost Prophets, Deluded Wizards, Addicted Alchemists, and Us. Mr. Zaidi. Good evening, everyone. It's, thank you very much, Dr. Scoble, and thank you to the Linnaean Society for the invitation this evening. As you can see from the title, Lost Prophets, Deluded Wizards, Addicted Alchemists, of which I'm one, and us, is about how we are viewed on planet Earth by the first two, lost prophets and deluded wizards. But before we move on to who they are, let's actually just focus on planet Earth. Now, Milan Milankovic in 1914 had just uh, got married. He was on his honeymoon when World War I broke out. He was a Serbian mathematician and an engineer, and he was arrested and taken to prison uh, as a POW by the Austrian authorities. His fiance went to his professor, and the professor managed to get him to the Hungarian uh, Academy of Science in Budapest, where he spent four years. And while he was there for four years, what you see up there is what he came up with. He came up with the uh, mathematical concept that the Earth is doing three things, and this has been going on for millennia. So the Earth has an eccentricity in terms of orbit. Our current orbit is quite circular, but every 100,000 years, that orbit becomes elliptical. Second, the Earth has a tilt, uh, and it, it moves back and forth in this tilt. We are currently becoming a bit straighter, and this happens every 41,000 years. And thirdly, we tend to wobble, and that changes the North Star in Vega. So we're doing three things, and this is what he came up with. So we're spinning, we're tilting, and we're wobbling as we're whirling around. At the same time, the Earth is releasing electromagnetic waves, and the first person to calculate them and, and uh, figure out the formula uh, was Carl Friedrich Gauss, and the, all the financial engineers sitting in here uh, should know their Gaussian distributions, which is essentially what the entire field of modern-day finance is based on. So the Earth is doing those two critical things. Why does it matter? Because while the Earth is doing all of spinning, wobbling, and tilting, and issuing all these electromagnetic waves, this is what the Earth looks like in terms of its record. What's the critical aspect here? 
Homo erectus turns up two million years ago. Its ancestors go forward, many of them disappear. What's really left are Neanderthals, Denisovians, and Homo sapiens. And Homo sapiens, for I'm sure all of the uh, society members know here, is coined by Carl Linnaeus. We're the only ones that are left. And if you see that red line there, that is our human current civilization. And if you see the two red dots there, that is what we are proposing, climate scientists say, we will be going to in the next 50 to 70 years. So where does that take us back to? Well, it kind of takes us back to pre-Homo erectus temperatures. So we're headed back to the Pliocene. And, and what, is the, what, what, what was the Pliocene like? Pliocene is obviously much warmer. Uh, there's a lot more grasslands, not as many trees. And critically, the sea is 25 meters higher than it is today. So if we can imagine that, if we actually get to those red dots, we're going to be in, a, in an era that existed before Homo erectus. So Earth will be fine. Uh, it's human life we're actually really discussing. Now enter the lost prophets and the deluded wizards. Now the lost prophets, uh, the title comes from this book, The Wizard and the Prophet, uh, by Charles Mann. Uh, the prophet here is William Vogt, you can see here. And he uh, essentially came up with the idea that the Earth is finite, it's overpopulated, uh, and we're going to need two Earths, and we need to cut back. Next to him are two other prophets, or what I have termed prophets. It's James Hansen from NASA and Bill McKibben of 350 parts per millionth of carbon, who believe that uh, the world is finite, that we're taking too much from planet Earth, uh, and that we need to cut back and leave a smaller footprint for us to survive. So that's a vision of the lost prophets, and this comes from the fact that we're headed up to that first dot. A competing vision comes from the deluded uh, wizards, and in, in Charles Mann's book, the deluded, or for him, the wizard is Norman Borlaug. Norman Borlaug is the is a, is a father of uh, of uh, green technology and farming. Uh, he received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. And he believed that science applied correctly would be the answer to the woes of uh, overpopulation. I have put two deluded wizards here whom I've had some interaction with. Uh, first one is uh, Johan Rockström, and his, uh, he has planetary boundaries. Nine pan if we cross those planetary boundaries, the world will fall apart, and we need to stay within those boundaries for sustainable development. So deluded wizards believe in one critical thing. They believe that development is sustainable, that growth can be circular, and then if it's properly applied science, will get us there. And their mantra is innovate, innovate, and the human ingenuity will, will bring us to this, uh, to this solution. But actually, they're saying the same thing. So if we go back for a moment and look at the Earth's record, what, what they're really saying is human beings are special. That's where they're agreeing. They're just agreeing. They're disagreeing on how to get there, but they both believe that there's, humans are special. The man on the wall over here, Darwin, does not. He thinks it's evolutionary. We're simply going to grow. 
we will overexpand, and then we hit collapse, and it'll be over. So the debate between lost profits and deluded wizards is not about the planet. It's about values, and they're representing two different values. But they have forgotten a third party. They have forgotten the addicted alchemists, and that's what's missing from Charles Mann's book. So the addicted alchemists, why are they important? Because the debate of values of this side between both the deluded wizards and the lost prophets against Darwin, by the way, that's a picture of the Linnaean gold medal, uh, which I discovered during the research that I didn't know it was given out. And the first one, this is a picture of the 1908 gold medal, first time it was given out to Henry Wallace as an aside. The debate here is uh, which of these values is critical? And the answer is neither, because it's the addicted alchemists and the way they maintain the energy and monetary infrastructures call the shots. So what do I mean by an energy and, and monetary system? Well, we all live in an energy system. And that energy system historically has a monetary system attached to it. And as we go through history, that growth paradigm changes. Our current paradigm is we borrow lots of money, that's credit, and we consume it. And this is multiplied by the energy system we have, which is currently fossil fuels. And this is maintained by the addicted alchemists. They, you cannot have it without them. And our values now reflect those two energy and monetary systems over time and over history. So I've just put three addicted alchemists here. The first one is uh, John Maynard Keynes. The second one is Alan Greenspan. And the third one is Mike Milken. And each of them represents a different type of alchemy. Now, Keynes alchemy is well known to most of us here because we hear it from the government all the time, which is uh, GDP, gross domestic product. And Simon Kuznets is the one that actually came up with the formula from Keynes's work. And what is GDP? It's consumption uh, plus investment plus government spending uh, and net exports. And we measure our growth through this number. Alan Greenspan measures something else. So we always hear from our central banker friends that we cannot have an inflation rate greater than 2%. Well, why does that matter? Well, that 2% is monetarism. So that is represented by Alan Greenspan and pretty much the entire central banking community. They're obsessed over maintaining price stability for consumer items. It's nothing to do with asset prices, but consumption price stability. And that's their view of how alchemy should work. But in reality, what, what we think is the person who's probably got it the most right in our modern society is Mike Milken. And he came up with this formula that is H is uh, human capital, social capital, and real assets, all multi multiplied by the key item, which is financial engineering. What is financial engineering? It's the ability to change the capital structure, the issuance of debt, the issuance of equity. And it's really difficult to measure human capital, social capital, and real assets. So human capital would be the population education system. Social capital would be our hospitals, our police, our laws. And real assets is if we had any oil or diamonds and real estate would be that. But financial engineering, that's the city of London. That is the multiplier. So what we did was simply replace that with an energy system because we always have to have an energy system. And energy systems change over time. And ed energy systems have different leverage points, meaning So here's a history of, of, of energy. So in the brown, 
is biomass. And you could add to the biomass a humanity in, in the form of slaves. That was an energy system. And that existed until the discovery of coal, which gets, now you can get more kilowatts per kilogram. There's, there's more energy density there. You don't require the biomass or the humans as much, and we go on to coal and fossil fuels. Then arrives oil, which is another upgrade on our energy leverage. And right now, we are just changing energy systems to a natural gas system. And at the top, you see all the alternative energies. So we have an energy system that has its own leverage. And we have a money system that has its own leverage coming together, on which sit the values of the prophets and the wizards. So what is our current money system? The first thing to walk away from our current money system is it's exponential. And that system started in 1971 when we went off the gold standard, which is not exponential, it's rather stable. Uh, and the reason you, you see up there the two colors is there's always international money in every historic period. So you can go back at nearly the last 150 years and there's some form of international money and international money is the final means of payment. What are we willing to accept at the end of our transactions? And right now, that is the US Treasury on a global basis. Money is simply the means of domestic settlement. So here money would be pounds, but international money is dollars and specifically the US Treasury. System today is open versus it used to be closed, meaning you can now move money in and out. Prior to 1976, you couldn't take out pounds out of the country without approval from the central bank. And the trade system is global. So why does this matter? Because the way the system is set up is it is interlinked. So there are a number of accountants here, so they'll know the uh, T function coming up. And there is a hierarchy in society. At the top of the hierarchy sits the government. The next in the hierarchy is the central bank. The next in the hierarchy are the, is the financial sector, and we're at the bottom. And there is a linkages for, for it throughout. So government bonds is the same as that US Treasury right at the top. So why does this matter? The whole system is interlinked. So the government issues debt. It collects our taxes on the right side. The central bank purchases the debt. It issues us currency. The financial sector holds the currency for us in the bank account, gives us a deposit. The deposit is our asset, and then we end up paying tax taking us right back to the top. So the system is based on an exponential issuance of debt. You have to keep issuing those government bonds for the system to function today the way it's set up. And that is the reason we have the standard of living that we do. Because once you issue liabilities, your assets also have to go up because the balance sheet has to balance. And in the last 40 years, we've had nearly, just in the US, $70 trillion worth of debt issued. That's 70 trillion. So our current model looks like this. It's an exponential function that is interlinked. So we have an energy system that has its own leverage, which is currently oil and natural gas primarily, with a little bit of coal and a little bit of alternatives, multiplied by 
our monetary system, which is an exponential function. And then it's interlinked throughout. So if it starts going down, everything goes down. Because once you start reducing liabilities, your assets will also have to go down. So for instance, in 2008, uh, liabilities never went down. The government issued bonds and saved the system. So, so why does all of this matter? Because we live in this little box of, uh, that you see up there. And uh, that represents about 70 years, a human, an average lifetime. And so the lost profits and the deluded wizards are speaking to different audiences and different time scales. So when you listen to a lost prophet, uh, they're really talking in geologic time. It's not gonna occur within a human lifetime. It's very far away. And that's why that you can keep pushing it back. Uh, in fact, it's almost theological. So, but, and you can replace these with your own time timeline for an illusion of time. The deluded wizards, though, they speak to us in our own time. So they're talking about disease, they're talking about agricultural systems like Norman Borlaug. Uh, but the addicted alchemists speak to us in real time. They speak to us in market time. They're speaking to us here and now. And we, we listen to that very carefully because we measure everything that they say. So they're the ones that are actually setting the ground for the conversation on how our value systems exist between prophets and wizards. So if we look at it on a historic basis, uh, and my background is um, actually financial history. Most of our human civilization, that is, let's call it the last 5,000 years on that little red line, is agrarian. Then we get a little bit of industria in the last 150 years. And that blue line you see is equal to about three trillion barrels of oil that we have consumed since that time. So three trillion barrels of oil. And that accounts for standard of living. We have everything in this room is some form of fossil fuel. What we're wearing, everything. And we are now transitioning to a different type of life. I've just named it Electrica instead of Digita. It seems like a simple thing to say. But it's the quantum of, of fossil fuels that we've used that is really being discussed with that line going up to that red dot. And it's been accumulated over 150 years. And that changes so each of these systems represents a value, a value system and a caloric consumption system and an energy system and a money system. So if you just looked at agraria, it's primarily all biomass and slavery. Its money system is rather local and the killer calories consumes aren't metabolic calories, it's, uh, it's what you need for a civilization. So in, in, in Roman times and forwards, it's roughly the average Romans got about five to 10,000 calories a day. And the value system I've named just religious, it's seven lean years and seven fat years. That was a value system and that existed for thousands of years in some way, shape or form. Then along comes industria, we move to coal, much better energy system, and oil, even better energy system, and slightly more levered up money on a slightly more global basis. And our calorie count gets another zero. So we are now 
improving our standard of living. And we go from 50 to, to 90,000 calories a day, and this is just around World War I. Today, the key system is the monetary system. Why? Because our energy system really doesn't have that much leverage left in it, especially natural gas. The natural gas system is delevering us. So we've increased our monetary leverage. So we have global unlimited credit that government can issue quantums of debt against us as the asset. So if you go, go back and recall the, the T-junction, they're issuing debt against us so we can maintain the asset and liability system that we have, our modern day of life. So the credit system is unlimited. The calories now are between 90 to 500,000 a day. So if you imagine how many calories you would use up in a day, just in a travel, your food, what we're wearing, the machines we're operating, and our value system today is material and consumption and credit. So if you look at the three value systems, and I, I forgot to mention the, the value system for industria, I think it's quite martial because the system was investment and savings. You have to invest and save, not borrow and consume. We're still talking the language of industria, but we're living in Electrica. We are in the consumption credit world, but we're still talking the uh, investment savings world. We're still in GDP while we've moved on to a, an entirely different system. But our conversation hasn't changed there. So if you look at the three systems, you've had a religious system, you've had a martial system, and our system is, our value system is quite material. And, and why is that? Uh, why is that an issue? Because lost prophets think that they're doing battle with fossil fuels, always carbon, carbon emissions. Carbon emissions are in the numerator. Fossil fuel, it is, is in the numerator. It's barrels per dollar. The numerator is not the driver. The driver is in the denominator, and the denominator is money. So the lost profits are lost because they're actually not discussing the critical thing. It is not our carbon we have emitted, it's our ability to purchase that carbon. How are we able to purchase the carbon? How are we continually able to buy the fuels we need? A lot of the world is unable to buy those fuels because they have no access to money. So it's the denominator that's the driving factor, not the numerator. And the deluded wizards have forgotten actually just human nature. And our nature is we want more and more. Enough is never enough. We always want an upgrade. We want to move to the next thing. Uh, we want the next innovation. We want the next technology. Uh, and that's our nature. They think that if they provide the, that technological gain, like Norman Borlaug did in the Green Revolution, that that should be enough. No, that wasn't enough. Because then we will migrate to, I just don't want to eat wheat, I want to eat meat. We will always want that next more. And we have to say, how are we getting the next more? We're getting the next more, again, through the addicted alchemists. Their ability to provide us the money gives us the ability to ask for more. I could ask this audience, what was it, when was the last time anyone in this audience paid the full retail value of their phone? I, you have? Wonderful. That's, that's one. That's two. And that's three, and that's four. A rather small amount of number of people. Uh, and that is, and there's five. And you've not upgraded. <laughs> so, a very, very small minority. 
And what does is, what is that very simple device represent? That simple device isn't technology. That simple device is credit. Because we are paying 20 pounds a month or 15 pounds a month for that phone. No one has paid the upfront price of that phone. So that phone is credit. It's like the old washing machine or the car or the TV. So it's the credit that's driving it. The, it's the credit that is, an, again, in the denominator. And this argument over biodiversity and climate between lost profits and wizards is, again, an argument of values, not of the planet. And both are controlled by finance. So if, if you look at a very uh, simple formula here, lost profits are limits. Deluded wizards are selling us innovation. The addicted alchemists are selling us an energy and financial system. And this has been the consequence of that system. So the green line is the uh, Living Planet Index from the ZSL uh, since 1971. Uh, that's lost about 60% of its value, which is the way they're measuring biodiversity. The orange line is just uh, US total credit. So the amount of credit in the United States that is government issued, corporate issued, household issued, all added together. And that little faint dot you see there is the financial crisis. The key thing to notice there is we had a crisis because credit went flat. It didn't grow. And the system demands growth the way we've set it up. And consequently, that is hockey staying back up again. And the consequence of that has been, well, we lose, our, we lose and continue to lose biodiversity. And that little red dot is back in play. 2050, we're going to get rising temperatures, hello Pliocene, we'll be looking at you in 100 years. It's because this line will keep rising, and it's rising at about 4% a year, just in the United States. You can now add that China, Europe, and the rest of the world, and these numbers are gargantuan. But that is our modern standard of living. That is actually what we want. So the consequence that you're seeing in the macro world, which lost profits and deluded wizards are very concerned over, and rightly so, is actually already occurring within all of us inside. So the same thing is occurring already to us in our own microbiome. So on the right side here is how uh, microbiome is passed from mother to child. And this is a study from Japan. Uh, they've kept this for the last uh, 60 years. So each step represents the loss of the biome, microbiome that the mother is able to provide uh, the child. Because we are all reasonably, you know, we're all sterile in the womb as we're exiting. We actually get through the birth canal our core microbiome biota comes up because we swallow it, we're smeared in it as we exit. So if you have a C-section, no microbiome for you. You only get the skin biome and you only get the one from your mouth. Over the last 60 years, every generation, we're losing a step of microdiversity within ourselves. And how does it look between populations? Uh, on, the, on the green there, you see the uh, Yamamami Indians. So they are, they've got the most diverse microbiota. Why is that? They eat lots of fiber, and they eat sort of all kinds of food, and they don't have any antibiotics in their system. As we industrialize, we lose about 60% of our, we've lost about 60% of our microbiota. So what is happening on the outside is actually already occurring much faster on the inside, 
much faster. So within my lifetime, in the 1980s, one out of 10 Americans were, was obese. Now it's one out of three. The rise of obesity is directly correlated to the overuse of antibiotics. So on, on average, an American is taking, especially on the right side, you see the darker elements in the states there, more than one to two courses of antibiotics in a single year. And what do antibiotics do? They entirely destroy your, your biome. Year in, year out, year in, year out. Over the last 30 years. The cycle is much faster inside us than outside us. So we are being, we are being concerned with the outside world, we should actually be much more concerned with the inside world and our own biome. So the key question is, do we all in the room think we're special? Yeah. If we think we're special, the answers aren't being provided by the lost prophets. The answers aren't being provided by the deluded wizards. And the answers aren't being provided by the addicted alchemists. The answer actually lies within ourselves. So if we are able to alter our own biome at the beginning, and I, I'll, I, I started looking at this topic 10 years ago, uh, thanks to uh, the founder of Synchronicity Earth who asked me to be on their advisory board. And initially when I heard all the information on the Earth, I completely agreed with the lost prophets. We need two Earths. We need to stop what uh, finite was the answer. And then as a little time went on, the deluded wizards started making a lot more sense, saying we need uh, technology will answer it. We will get solar cells and we will have sustainable development and, and the like. And I thought they were the right answer. And then finally the realization set in that the addicted alchemists run the show and the scale is so gargantuan that nothing will be occurring because there's no way we're able to want to reduce those 500,000 kilocalories that we wish to consume. So all we can do is actually look to ourselves to see if we can alter our own internal behavior. And if we do that, uh, maybe our, our prophets will find some form of solace and our, our, our wizards will stop worshiping the deity of uh, technology. And we can tell our addicted alchemists that value is not price, and all consumption is not a value. So for me on a personal level, the word that I've walked away with throughout this entire decade long process is the word umbilical. Because we are attached firstly to ourselves, uniquely to ourselves, secondly to everyone around us, and lastly, to the planet. So for me, for us here in the room, if you walk away with anything from this in talk, you can walk away with the word umbilical. Thank you.